the Old Testament, God spoke to his people through his prophets. In our time, many claim to qualify as a prophet. But what are the biblical requirements and standards? Listen as Francois will point out that God is still speaking through a prophet in modern times. Whenever I tour, I visit the different places of worship. You're looking at the famous St. Paul's in London. During my visit to St. Albans in England, I thought of the parishioners who worshipped here through the ages. Some of them lived victorious lives, others not. I also had the privilege of visiting the famous Kaiser Wilhelm Church in Berlin. While I thought of the many sermons that were delivered here over the years, I thought of something that Jesus warned about, false prophets. Thousands of modern day prophets claim that they have a message from God. How can you and I be sure that they are true prophets from God? Someone wrote these words on the back cover of the book, The Thunder of Justice. It says, explores the convergence of many recent messages that have been received by mystics and visionaries around the world concerning the future, opens a way to discernment and scholarly discussion. Ted Flynn is a realist and a prophet. This was written by Father René Laurentin, world-famous Mariologist. How do we know that Flynn is a true prophet? We will have to consult scripture on this issue. In Jude 14 and 15, we read about the very first prophet and his message. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way. And all of the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch was the first prophet who prophesied of the second coming of Christ. Let's listen to the message of the last prophet in the New Testament. Revelation 22 verse 20 He who testifies to these things say, Yes, I am coming soon. I like this. The very first and the very last prophets prophesied about the blessed hope, the second coming of Christ. Amos 3.7 gives us an explanation concerning the work of a prophet. Surely the sovereign law does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The Bible prophets warned about the appearances, apparitions of deceased loved ones long before it happened. It is imperative to study the end time prophecies. Why? They unmask the wiles of the devil. A study of the scriptures is our only safeguard against the deceptions of the evil one. Let us listen to more information concerning the work of a prophet. Hosea 12 verse 13 The Lord used a prophet to bring Israel up from Egypt. By a prophet he cared for him. Can we expect that the Lord will send another prophet to lead his remnant people from the Egypt of sin to the Canaan of everlasting life? The Bible narrative tells us that Moses died before leading Israel into the promised land. He was buried on Mount Nebo. According to the principles of typology, we can also expect an end-time prophet who will die before leading God's remnant into the heavenly promised land. Let's look at another function of a prophet. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Did you get the point? A prophet will lead people to a life of obedience to God's law. This was true of prophets of old, in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament, and also during the end times. Proverbs 28 verse 9, If anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. Did you know that there is a verse in Scripture that says when people ignore the law of God, the genuine prophetic dynamic ceases. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 9 The law is no more, and her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. By implication, this verse tells us, someone who acts as a prophet but ignores the claims of the law is a false prophet. John chapter 21 verse 25 Jesus did many more things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. 
Not all prophetic inspired messages are recorded as we've seen in the canon of scripture. This phenomenon does not make them less inspired. Let's look at more examples. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 29 As for the events of King David's reign from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet and the records of Gad the seer. Although we read of inspired messages from the pen of Samuel, we do not find it in the canon of scriptures. As I mentioned earlier, this phenomenon does not make them less inspired. Let's read about an inspired letter from Paul to the church at Laodicea, which was not included in the canon of scripture. Colossians 4.16 After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. While walking through the ruins of ancient Laodicea, I thought of the interesting parallel between Paul and Ellen White. Both of them wrote letters to Laodicea, Paul to the ancient city, and Ellen White to the Laodicea of our day. In God's providence, these messages have not been included in the canon of scriptures, but this does not make them less inspired. Hosea 12 verse 11 explains how God communicated with the prophets. I spoke to the prophets, gave them visions and told parables through them. Why were the prophetic visions given in symbols? One reason is for protection. If some of God's enemies were clearly identified and judged, they could have destroyed these inspired prophetic messages. 2 Peter 1 verses 20 and 21 Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Whether these inspired messages are found inside or outside the Bible, they still remain the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll discover in this lecture that the last prophet to the remnant was a woman called Ellen White. Let's read a few verses in scripture where it mentions women in the prophetic role. Exodus 15.20 Then Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Judges 4 verse 4 Deborah a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was leading Israel at that time. When it comes to the prophetic gift, God uses whoever is available to carry his clear messages to his people. 2 Kings 22 verse 13 Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. In what manner did they consult the Lord in those days? By means of his prophet. During King Josiah's reign, there were two prophets, Jeremiah and Huldah. Let's see which of the two were consulted. Verses 14 to 16, Hilkiah, the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Aziah, went to speak to the prophetess Hulda, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the second district. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Let's ask Jesus to tell us about the continuity of the prophetic gift in the New Testament. Matthew 5.17 Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This verse tells us that the prophetic gift will be present till the end of time. Let us briefly look at women who had the gift in the New Testament times. Luke 2 verse 36 and 37 There was also a prophetess, Anna, 
the daughter of Fanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. At the end of Paul's third missionary journey, he visited the city of Caesarea. Here he met Philip the Evangelist. Let's read something interesting about his four daughters. Acts 21 verse 9, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So many people today claim that they have the prophetic gift. Do we have any guidelines in the Bible concerning the tests of a true prophet? Matthew 24 verse 11, And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. As we near the time of the end, many false prophets will appear. They will claim that God sent them with messages from heaven. How are we to relate to them? Should we blindly listen to what they say? Or should we inquire whether they are true or false? 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-21 do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Does the Bible give us certain tools with which to test the so-called prophet? Yes, let's read about it. Isaiah 8 verse 20 To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. We all know what the law is, but what about the testimony? Well, it refers to all the truths taught by previous prophets. Later prophets always build on what the previous prophets revealed. Of all the modern prophets, Ellen White is the only end-time prophet that upholds all the commandments of God. All her writings are in perfect harmony with the teachings of the previous Bible prophets. The first major test concerns the law and the testimony. Let us look at the doctrine of the state of the dead. We will first go to the Bible and then see if Ellen White is in harmony with Scripture. Let's begin with Job. Job 14, 10-12 But man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. As water disappears from the sea or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. Men will not awake or be roused from their sleep. Let's ask David if he agrees with the inspired explanation of Job. Psalms 146 verses 2 to 4 Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day their plans come to nothing. David agrees fully with Job over this issue. Let's see if the same Holy Spirit inspired Solomon in his explanation on the state of the dead. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 For the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. They have no further reward and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. John 11 verse 11 After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Verses 12 to 14, his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant a natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. That's clear as crystal. Jesus is in perfect harmony the rest of the Bible prophets on this issue. Let's also get Paul's input on this issue. Does he agree with Jesus and the rest of the inspired prophets that the dead sleep in their graves till the resurrection morning? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15-18 According to the Lord's own word, we tell you 
that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Ellen White is the only end-time prophet who teaches that the law of God is still binding. She is the only end-time prophet who believes, as the Bible teaches, that when you die, you sleep in the grave till the time of the second coming of Jesus. She passes the first great test to the law and to the testimony. The second important test concerns the fruit of the prophet. Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20 Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Time does not allow me to tell you about the fruit that this godly lady bore. She is regarded by scholars as the greatest female author of all time. Her publications that were translated in more than a hundred languages touched and changed the lives of millions all over the world. She passes the second test with flying colors. Let's consider the third test. Deuteronomy 18 verses 21 and 22. You may say to yourselves, How can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come through, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. In 1890, Ellen White predicted a world war in which many ships, thousands, would sink. At the time of this prophecy, there was no thought of war in the minds of the political leaders. No political analyst ever dreamt that a major war was on the horizon. Her publications on health ranks amongst the best in the medical journals. A literature on health was at least a century ahead of all medical knowledge when it was written. Medical science is still discovering the truth of what she wrote more than a century ago. 1 John chapter 4 verse 2 This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. When you consult the indexes to Ellen White's publications, you make a very interesting observation. There are 40 pages with numerous references to Christ as 100% man and 100% God. No other author has written so extensively on the life of Christ as Ellen White. She graduates with flying colors on the fourth test. In a touching manner, she describes how Jesus agonizes in Gethsemane. She does it in such a vivid way that the reader feels he is a spectator. In a gripping way, she depicts the scenes in Pilate's palace when Jesus is condemned to death. Then she takes you to Calvary. She writes as a personal witness to the scenes that transpired at the foot of the cross. If you need a spiritual uplift, a spiritual renewal, if you need a fresh look at the Son of God, then I would strongly urge you to read this beautiful book, The Desire of the Ages. Let's ask Ellen White to tell us more about the function of her books. If the Bible is our only rule of faith, why do we need additional spiritual material? This may create the impression that her books take the place of the Bible. She writes in Core Porter Ministry, page 125, Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. When you read her works, you appreciate the power of this statement. Her messages 
point you to the Word of God and to Jesus, the sinner's only hope. When you look at the stars at night, your naked eye cannot pick up all of their beauty. You need a telescope to see the hidden wonders of the sky. The same applies to the Bible. Her writings are like a telescope that brings out the hidden wonders of God's Word. In the preface of the book, The Climax of the Ages, Ellen White makes this interesting remark concerning the Bible. In his word, God has committed to men the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Yet the fact that God has revealed his will to men through his word has not rendered needless the continued presence of and guiding of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, the Spirit was promised by our Saviour to open the Word to His servants, to illuminate and apply its teachings. And since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teaching of the Spirit should ever be contrary to that of the Word. Besides the four major tests of a true prophet, there are also a few physical tests that we have to consider. The prophet Daniel explains, chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left, my face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. When a prophet receives a vision, he first becomes powerless. You see, God must get all the credit in every revelation. He has to strengthen the prophet in order to receive and communicate the vision. What happens next? Verses 10 and 11. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. The entire process is supernatural. Initially the prophet becomes weak and then God strengthens him. The same thought is repeated in verse 18 and 19. Again the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. Let us consider another physical test. Verses 16 and 17. And, behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Every time Ellen White had a vision, she stopped breathing just like Daniel did. At times when medical doctors were present, they closed her mouth and nose to check whether the vision was genuine. She passed these medical tests and continued in vision without breathing. Whenever somebody claims to have the prophetic gift, test them. See if they breathe while having a vision. Usually they breathe. Another physical test is open eyes while in vision. Numbers 24 verse 16. The oracle of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. One of my favorite verses on prophets come from the book of Chronicles. Listen to this. Second Chronicles 20 verse 20 
Early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. In his vision of the woman clothed with the sun in Revelation 12, John saw something very interesting. The woman represents the remnant church, and she has two main characteristics. She is a law-abiding church, and she has the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12 verse 17 Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We know what the law is, but we need to find out what the testimony of Jesus is. Revelation 19 verse 10 At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And now we want to know who this fellow servant is who upholds the testimony of Jesus. It could be a prophet. Let's probe a little deeper. Revelation 22 verse 9, But he said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and all who keep the words of this book worship God. So when we read the phrase, the testimony of Jesus, we know that it refers to the prophetic gift in the remnant church. The Seventh-day Adventist church thank the Lord in all humility for the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Through the writings of Ellen White, he has furnished this church with all the inspired literature needed to face the last great crisis and prepare for the second coming of Jesus. The writings of Ellen White covers the entire spectrum of human living. She has excellent advice for young people looking for a companion. Her advice on courtship and marriage is excellent, but she continues advising young couples in child education. Her advice on interpersonal relationships is impeccable. Her writings offer psychological guidelines second to none. May I invite you to read these inspired books. You will enrich yourselves spiritually. Read these books in conjunction with the Bible. When you implement the counsel, you will reap tremendous benefits. I had the privilege of visiting Oak Hill Cemetery in Battle Creek, USA. This is where Ellen White was laid to rest. When I came there, I knelt next to a tombstone and thanked the Lord for sending us a prophet like her. The counsel in her writings gave me a new purpose in life. It inspired me to reach for more than just the mundane and ordinary achievements of life. I was one of the most miserable, sickly and depressed young people in my hometown. I read a counsel on health implemented the principles and became a changed, happy person. My first job was a printer, but I was an unfulfilled worker. I read a book called Corporate Ministry and it challenged me to do higher service. I resigned and became a successful, fulfilled literature evangelist. While I read about God's high ideal for every human being, it inspired and challenged me. She helped me through my life to make new paradigm shifts. I cannot thank the Lord enough for the way in which he led in the life of a below average person like myself. My prayer for you is that God will do the very same for you. Make the reading of the books of the Spirit of Prophecy part of your lifestyle. In closing, I'll leave the following inspired message with you. Second Chronicles 20 verse 20 Listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Thank you, Francois. You know, if a person meets the heavenly standard of a prophet, I'm willing to listen and accept the message. How about you? Let's say a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to us. 
Prepare us to accept the messages of love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.